Let's go to the Lord in prayer as we prepare our hearts. Father, we are so thankful for your word. It's as sweet as a honeycomb. And Lord, that's like saying in Old Testament language, it's as good as a Kit Kat. It's just wonderful. Sweet like a honeycomb, it was that place of delight for the Hebrew writer. Your word, he longed for the morning hours so that he might be able to read it. There was a passion. Your word is a, just a lamp and a light. And as we study it now, I ask God that you would help us to dig deep to understand for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Last week, we came to an understanding about the millennial kingdom that there is a spiritual kingdom and there is a physical kingdom. Let's talk first about the spiritual kingdom that Jesus leads right now. It's, it's called the church, his bride. In John chapter 18, 36, when Jesus was talking to Pilate, he said that my kingdom is not of this world. And what he was communicating was he does not have a political reign in his first coming. In his first coming, he was describing to Pilate more of a spiritual kingdom. I didn't come to establish a political rule. The Jews did not understand that. It's a spiritual kingdom. A spiritual kingdom in which he reigns in heaven. Paul would say this of that spiritual kingdom in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 18. And the Lord will deliver me from every evil work and preserve me for his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Jesus is the king of heaven. He is the ruler of the church, his bride. He doesn't refer to as ruler, though he is our ruler and our king. We are his subjects. He loves us so dearly, he calls us his bride. We studied last week, Colossians 1 would confirm this. He's the head of the church. And Peter would even go so far in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, he would say, but you're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. And what I want you to note is the present tense. You are a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. This is something for us to do now as we live in this spiritual kingdom with Christ in our hearts. But there also will be a physical kingdom, one in which Jesus will rule and reign on the earth ruling over the entire world. It's to fulfill a promise. You remember Psalm chapter 2. The father says to the son, ask me, ask me for an inheritance and I will give you the nations. And God fulfills his promise in Psalm chapter 2 with a physical kingdom that Jesus Christ will rule and reign over. If you remember, Zechariah introduced us to this truth. You'll see it in Zechariah chapter 2, verse 10 and 11. Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion, for behold, I am coming and I will dwell in your midst. I'm going to come to earth and dwell in your midst. Do you remember what the angel said? When Jesus ascended, they said in the same way that he left, he will come back. He will come back to earth where he will rule and reign. Many nations shall be joined to the Lord in that day, and they shall become my people, and I will dwell in your midst, re-emphasizing the point. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. Even the Psalms would proclaim. There in Psalm chapter 72, verse 8, the Bible would remind us, he shall have dominion, also from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. Verse 16, there will be abundance of grain in the earth 
on the top of the mountains. Its fruit shall wave like Lebanon, and those of the city shall flourish like grass of the earth. Psalm 72, verse 19. And blessed be his glorious name forever, and let the whole earth be filled with his glory. Let the church say, Amen and Amen. Amen. Now, we discuss several theologies, and I've decided that there is a amillennialist, someone who believes that it's an allegory, that the spiritual kingdom exists today, and that Jesus is currently reigning, and the thousand years is an allegorical presentation. Some are post-millennial referring to the second coming of Christ, that Jesus will come after the church age and the church will usher in with righteousness the, and the, the, the whole world will become such a righteous place because of the church, then Jesus will come. Then there are the premillennialists. And the premillennialists, it means it's simply what it des- describes, that Jesus Christ will come before the thousand-year reign. Now, after last week, I've decided that I'm a pan-millennialist. I had so many of you email me with questions and email me with details and ask me things in the lobby. I have decided to change my theology, and I'm a pan-millennialist. It will all pan out in the end, so don't worry about it. A friend of mine said that he believes that the rapture is currently happening today. And I said to him, what do you mean? He goes, one by one as we die, we're being raptured straight to heaven. Now church, we believe here at Calvary Chapel in a premillennial theology. I'm actually not a panmillennialist, so don't email me, please, and begin and look up on Wikipedia. So most of you get your theology from Wikipedia. So we gotta we gotta work on that one. At least go to blueletterbible.com, okay? Crossroads or study light. And so we have an understanding here at Calvary Chapel as premillennialists. We believe that Christ will come before the thousand-year reign. And so I want us to further understand this premillennial view if you'll take a look at the timeline that we have put together in order for us to fully understand. Now, you will see in the far left-hand corner the church age. The church age, known as the age of grace. Paul, in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 through 7, would describe for us this incredible age of grace, a dispensation of grace. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son. God, who is not willing that any should perish and desires all men to be saved, We have to understand that in this church age, there is an opportunity of salvation for all people in this church age. At the end of this church age, there will be the glorious rapture of the church. I'm just hoping one day when I'm preaching it, it'll happen. Wouldn't that be just so great where you're sitting in church? Like, no one wants to be watching a bad movie at the rapture, right? Like, no one wants to be upset with their wife at the rapture. Just think, like, as you're on your way to meet Jesus in the clouds, like, you and your wife are solving a problem. You know, it's kind of like, okay, look, we're going to be fraternity. Now we know it's for real. Can we just get along, right? So the rapture is going to happen. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 helps us understand the rapture theology, but we also see a type and picture of the rapture in the book of Revelation. If you remember, Jesus introduces us to the Revelation in Revelation chapter 1. In Revelation chapter 2 and 3, we have the seven letters to the churches. This would be referred to as the seven churches or the seven complete age of the church. uh, That would be known as the church age in Revelation 2 and 3. In chapter 4, a dynamic happens with John, who is a believer. The angel of the Lord says to John, come up here in Revelation chapter 4, and John is caught up. The idea of that is that at the end of the church age, we see a type of rapture in the apostle John. Now, 
Some of you will say, wait a second, you've got a space between the rapture and the seven-year tribulation. Aha, you're very smart. We don't know from Scripture if the rapture initiates the seven-year tribulation. The rapture, imagine millions of people are gone. Imagine car accidents on the 405. Imagine with me planes dropping out of the sky with no pilots. Imagine the world chaos that will ensue when millions of people are vanished and gone. Can you imagine the CNN report that night? I would encourage you to watch Fox News. However, I believe most of them will be gone with us. If you will be here, God bless you, and I really, I mean it, God bless you, it is not going to be the incredible adventure that you may have read in the, um, uh, the uh, oh goodness, what was the name of the book? Sorry? Left Behind series. Um, the way they escape death so many times, um, it only happens in a novel, okay? The seven-year tribulation will ensue we don't know if the rapture will cause world cataclysmic events which will lead us to a place of the one thing that we know initiates the seven-year tribulation. There could be a month between the rapture and this. There could be a year between the rapture and this. The Bible does not indicate the amount of time between the rapture and the seven-year tribulation. The only thing that we know initiates the seven-year tribulation is the signing of a peace treaty between the Antichrist and the nation of Israel. When that peace treaty, the covenant, is signed between the Antichrist and Israel, and if you're taking note, that's in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, on that day, start counting 1,260 days because you have entered the first half of the tribulation period. It is three and a half years on a lunar, not solar calendar because this is a Jewish book, not an American book, okay? This is a book written by a Hebrew God who we know was a lunar 30-day calendar. Three and a half years would be 1,260 days. In the middle of that seven-year tribulation, you'll see just a demarcation of another three and a half years, the Antichrist will sit on the throne of God on the newly built temple. That is known as the abomination of desolation. That's the title, like saying, Mr. Lowe, it's the title. Abomination of Desolation is the titled name from God because he looks at it as an abomination. He looks at it as the world has gone desolate because they're allowing a man to sit on the throne of God to be worshipped. Once that happens, there will be another three and a half year period and this is called the Great Tribulation. The Great Tribulation is where we see the three woes of God. Now, when God goes, whoa, when God surprises himself, like, whoa, I mean, whoa, right? Think about it for just a moment that he calls them woes, woes. And it's during this time that the wrath of God will be poured out onto the world. Now, we look at the book of Revelation and the seven-year tribulation as God as an angry God. That is not the book of Revelation. God is doing whatever it takes to get man's attention. I love you and I'm trying for you to believe in me. How many of you have had wayward sons or daughters and you have finally said, Lord, whatever it takes... Get their attention. I've prayed that prayer for so many. Whatever it takes, get their attention. And God is doing whatever it takes to get people's attention 
during the seven-year tribulation. He wants people saved. That's why there's an angel going around the world saying, believe in the everlasting gospel. That's why there's two witnesses standing on the southern steps. Believe in the everlasting gospel. That's why there's 144,000 Jewish witnesses like the apostle Paul who were shouting, believe in the everlasting gospel. God's trying to get their attention and he's using people on earth to give the message. But... People reject God. In fact, the Bible says in the book of Revelation, they raise their fist at God instead of repenting and and believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. At the end of that seven-year tribulation, you will see another period. In Daniel chapter 12, we learned of two periods at the end of the seven-year tribulation. One lasted for 30 days, Daniel chapter 12, and one lasted for 45 days. In that first 30 days, the Lord will purify the temple. He will purify the temple of the fact that the Antichrist sat on the throne. And it will be a 30-day purification process according to Daniel chapter 12. Once the temple is purified, then... Daniel chapter 12 tells us there will be 45 days where blessed is he who makes it through those 45 days. What does that mean? Well, Jesus tells us in Matthew's gospel chapter 25, he's speaking of the end of the age after his second coming. Now let's go back to that if we could for just a moment. After the seven-year tribulation... Jerusalem will be attacked. And the Bible says that Jesus will come back the same way that he left. So he will come back on a cloud. He will put his feet on the Mount of Olives. They will divide east to the west. He will march into Jerusalem and radically save Jerusalem where they will look at Jesus and mourn, repent over the one that they pierced. There'll be a national Jewish revival during the second coming of Christ. Now, what I want you to note about the second coming, it's before the 30 days, it's before the 45 days, it's before the millennial kingdom. That's why we, personally, or myself, are premillennial. It means before the millennial kingdom. So the 30 days after Jesus returns in his second coming, he will purify the temple. The 45 days, Matthew 25, lets us know that Jesus will separate the sheep from the goats. Now, who are the sheep and who are the goats? These are human beings. Jesus refers to them as sheep. So the sheep of his pasture, it's a very common, we're known as sheep. The church is known as sheep. And goats are unbelievers. Sheep are believers. Goats are unbelievers. And Jesus comes on the scene and he judges the nations, those that are alive, those that made it through the seven-year tribulation, and they're alive. There will be believers that make it through, and there will be unbelievers. And Jesus will look at the sheep and he said, oh, righteous, you fed me when I was hungry. You gave me something to drink when I was thirsty. You clothed me when I was naked. When I was in prison, you came to visit me. He's speaking to those that took care of the Jews, God's people, during the seven-year tribulation. He looks at the goats and said, you didn't do a blessed thing. Depart. You're cursed. And he basically says, go to hell, which was prepared for the devil and his angels. And that's important. Hell was not created for human beings. It was created for the devil and his angels. Now, once the sheep and the goats are separated, we enter into the millennial kingdom. And the sheep, they will go right into the millennial kingdom and they will begin to live. Now, guess what? Where's the church? Well, the Bible says that we will be ruling and reigning over those sheep. So we will rule and reign. I've already told you, please do not ask for New Zealand. 
I am going to claim that one as my own. The Bible says, ask. So I will. Why not? How many of you have ever prayed for where you'd like to go on vacation? Think of living there for a thousand years. And so, now I've got a question. Jesus is ruling and reigning on the earth, but then I see Satan defeated at the end of the millennial kingdom. So I asked us a question last week. Why not just get rid of Satan at the second coming of Christ? I mean, come on, just get rid of this guy. We'll answer that question this week. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20. I almost want to be a professor in a classroom and say, does anyone have any questions? But I won't. Make sure you've taken your camera out and that you took a p- Don't take a picture of that. Make sure that you took a picture of that slide, there it is, so that you can refer to it when you read the book of Zechariah and all the verses in regards to the millennial kingdom. Revelation chapter 20. Then I saw an angel, verse 1, coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. Now, what I would like for you to note, it took an angel to bind the devil. It took an angel to bind the devil. And I want to encourage you, be careful when you are praying and you start talking to the devil. Prayer is reserved communication for God. Keep that in mind. Prayer is reserved communication for God. And please don't be so arrogant to think that the devil is in your house. Sometimes we give the devil God-like qualities, and we think he's omnipresent when he's not. He is one being, and he is not omnipresent. And in our prayer life, let's commune with God not the enemy. God will take care of the enemy as we see here in Revelation chapter 20. He laid hold of that dragon, that serpent of old, who's the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. So God has a plan in his releasing. God has a plan in his binding. Now look at verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they sat on them. Now we understood this to be the church. And judgment was committed to them, just like Jesus promised the disciples. Then another group of people, I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ. So both groups lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years, but the rest of the dead did not live again. So in other words, there's a first resurrection. So this resurrection is that of the living, uh, those that would go into eternal life, until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who is part in the first resurrection. So Praise God if you make it through the first one. Over such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. And we talked about that in detail last week. Now what we're going to do is pick it up in verse 7 where we left off. Now, when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, whose number is as as the sand of the sea. Satan returns to earth because that's where Christ is ruling and reigning, on earth. Now, what amazes me about this incredible satanic person, Satan himself, after a thousand years of prison reform, he has not changed. After a thousand years of being in jail, he has not changed. And I'll tell you why. There can be no true rehabilitation without the transforming work of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ alone changes and transforms. Verse 9. 
They went upon the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints in the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. The devil who deceived them, who cast them into the, was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet already are. And I added already because they were placed there when Jesus came at his second coming. And they will be tormented day and night forever. Gang, listen up. Satan is led out to deceive the nations after a thousand years. Why? Christ is reigning on the earth. Christ is reigning on the earth because God has fulfilled his promise to his son. You'll see it on the screen. It's uh, Psalm chapter 2, verse 8. God says to his son, ask of me and I'll give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. Satan is released to the earth to destroy the work of Christ. He's been trying to destroy the work of Christ since Adam and Eve. I don't know if you know this. Cain means I got him. In other words, Eve named Cain, he will crush the serpent's head. This is the one. Do you know what Abel means? Eh. That's what Abel means. Eh. We had another one. That's what Abel means. Eh. And what did Cain do to the righteous line? Kill. Satan has tried to destroy the righteous line at each and every generation of the church. He's tried to corrupt the line by putting such people like Rahab the harlot into the line, not knowing that Jesus would come to seek and to save not just Jews, but Gentiles alike. Church, God has been redeeming and saving this incredible Davidic line. Now, this is not the only promise fulfilled by God in regards to the millennial kingdom. Jesus was promised the earth. He was promised to rule and to reign. But there are other covenants, other promises that God has made that need to be fulfilled. For example, God has given the Jews a forever land covenant. And this land covenant can be found in Genesis 15. It can be found in Numbers chapter 34. It stretches from the river Nile to the river Euphrates. The Jews have never possessed the full extent of the promised land. And so, the millennial kingdom will be a fulfillment of God's promise to the Jews, and they will finally possess all of the land that God prophesied that they would possess. There's also a Davidic promise, a promise to David that he would have someone that would rule and reign on after his line forever, that his line would not die, die out, that there would be an heir that would reign forever. This is fulfilled in the Davidic, this is fulfilled in the millennial kingdom and stretches right into the eternal kingdom. But also the new covenant. In Jeremiah chapter 31, we see only a partial fulfillment of the new covenant. Yes, Jesus has come. His death and his recon- his uh, death and re- uh, resurrection reconcile our hearts to God. But part of the promise of the new covenant is to the Jews. He'll put a new heart into the Jew, and he will be their God. In fact, Ezekiel adds to the new covenant and says, "Not only will he be your God, he will he will also give you the land." Now, that scripture is found in Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 28. But I want you to see how many times a thousand years has been mentioned. A thousand years, a thousand years, a thousand years, a thousand years. How many times does God have to tell us in order for us to take this literally? And if he told us that that a woman, a virgin woman, would give birth to a child and it literally happened, is it possible that this is literal, I believe it to be so. 
So you see, it's in the book of Revelation that we learn for the first time the time frame of the physical reign of Christ. And in that time frame, God gives us that it will be a thousand years. So now I'm going to answer our question. I had asked, why not just get rid of Satan once and for all? Why bound him? Why bind him for a thousand years? Well, he does here. He releases him. And Satan tempts the nations. And they yield to their temptation, his temptation. It's as if God wants to make clear that even without Satan tempting people like the roaring lion seeking to whom he may devour, that man's heart is desperately wicked apart from grace. We don't even need Satan to tempt us because of our desperately wicked heart. Jeremiah chapter 17, look what the prophet wrote. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? A good friend of mine asked Pastor Chuck a question. Well, I'd like to know, Pastor Chuck, what's in your heart? Pastor Chuck responded and said, desperate wickedness. Think about that for just a moment. For a thousand years, there will be no devil. And what I want to describe for you right now, as you sit in the shock that these people would rebel against God. For a thousand years, there is no devil. And not only that, turn with me to Isaiah chapter 11. I want you to see what else is happening in this thousand years. Over the course of this millennial kingdom, Isaiah lets us know the kind of environment that we will have an opportunity to rule and reign with Christ. Take a look. It's Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1. There shall come from a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might the spirit of knowledge, and the fear of the Lord. Wouldn't you love for the President of the United States to be defined by verse 2? Wouldn't you love the leader of the the world to be able to be defined by verse 2? Imagine Jesus Christ ruling the world, and verse 2 describes him. Think of the kind of environment with a president of the world, with the king of the world, having these kinds of characters and qualities. Look at verse 3, if you uh, as, would as well. His delight is in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by the sight of his eyes, nor decide by the hearing of his ears. But with righteousness he shall judge the poor, and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall slay the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his loins, and faithfulness the belt of his waist. If you're an attorney, we have no need of you in the millennial kingdom. Because he is the prosecutor, he is the defender, he is the judge, and he is the jury. And every decision that he will make will be absolutely right. Imagine having a ruler that every decision they make is right in the sight of man and the sight of God. Everyone will go, that's the best decision. That's another great decision. That's another great decision. That's enough. Now, I know that's hard to imagine in the United States of America where we are divided 50 to 50%. Let me tell you something. We can put a spin on any decision that anyone makes. But imagine the king of the world making decisions for the world and the whole world goes, that's a great decision. This is the kind of world the millennial kingdom is going to be. Look at verse 6. The wolf... Now, please get your theology right. It does not say that the lion will lay down with the lamb. I know that's two L's. It says the wolf shall dwell with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the young goat. The calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. 
The cow and the bear shall graze, so all, we've all become vegetarians. Their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nurse, this is the one I love. The nursing child shall play by the cobra's hole. I ain't going near a cobra. Millennial kingdom or not. Goodness. I don't know how you can redeem a cobra. And the wean child shall put his hand in the viper's den. Try doing that today. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Paul defines the knowledge of the Lord in Ephesians chapter 3 as the love of Christ. Who can know, he says, the height, the width, the depth, and the length of the love of Christ? Everyone is going to be loving, even cobras. Even lions. Oh, it's my little cow friend. You want to speak cow today? I mean, just imagine the scene as you see. Sorry. As you, I should apologize for that. I don't know if cows and lions will talk, okay? But what the Bible is making clear is in the millennial kingdom on the earth, there is going to be environmental transformation. Isaiah chapter 35 tells us that the desert is going to bloom. Saudi Arabia is going to be green with flowers and corn growing all over the place. The Bible also tells us that deformities and disabilities will be healed. Deserts will have water in abundance. Isaiah chapter 2 says there's going to be any ravenous animals. The wolf and the lamb already know are going to be lying down together. Take a look, if you would, at verse 9. There shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. There's going to be real peace. And everyone is really going to be loving. It's like you're going to grow up in Andy Griffith's neighborhood. I don't, that was not in my notes. I have no idea where that one came from. And if you don't know who Andy Griffith is, God bless you. You shouldn't. <laughs> what was the son's name? Opie? There we go. Okay. I wouldn't even know a wholesome show to communicate today if to be able to communicate what I'm trying to get across. And in that day, there shall be a root of Jesse, verse 10, who shall stand as a banner to the people. In other words, it's going to be an example for the Gentiles. Imagine a world leader that actually is an example. Shall seek him, and his resting place shall be glorious. It shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people who are left from Assyria and Egypt and Pathros, Cush, Elam, Shinar, Hamath, and the islands of the sea. He will set up a banner for the nations. Now, what I want you to do is skip over with me to verse to chapter 12. Go with me to chapter 12. So excited is Isaiah about this millennial kingdom, this environmental transformation. Isaiah chapter 12, he bursts out into praise of this glorious era. Take a look. Oh Lord, I will praise you. Though you were angry with me, your anger is turned away and you comfort me. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For Yah, the Lord, is my strength and my song. He also has become my salvation. And I just imagine uh, 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 the worship leaders, like what we saw today in our stage, during the millennial kingdom will turn this Isaiah 12 into a worship song. And can you imagine us just walking up those southern steps, dancing and singing with joy and gladness in our heart? We're going to go see Jesus, man. Come on, little guy. We're going to go see Jesus. And everyone's running. And no one is like New York City bustling and hitting each other. And I want to see him first. No, you go ahead. No, you go ahead. No, you go ahead. Oh, I love you. Would you like to play with my pet cobra? I mean, just imagine the scene. <laughs> That wasn't in my notes either. <laughs> and in that day you will say, praise the Lord. Call upon his name. Declare his deeds among the peoples. Make mentions that his name is exalted. Sing to the Lord, for he's done excellent things. This is known in all the earth. Cry out and shout, O inhabitants of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel in your midst. Amen. Yet... 
The people who make it through the tribulation, the sheep who believe, they're going to have children. Isaiah chapter 65, you'll see it on the screen. Isaiah 65, verse 20. No more shall an infant from there live but a few days. So sin's going to be rolled back and people are going to start living longer. Nor an old man who has not fulfilled his days, for the child shall die 100 years. So a child who dies at 100 is known as a child. That's how long we're going to be living. A 100-year-old person that passes is considered a child. But the sinner being 100 years old shall be accursed. Wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. What, what, what happens in the millennial kingdom? What, what, what just happened? I mean, isn't this like cobras and lions and wolves and lambs? Like, what's going on here? You see, children will be born in the millennial kingdom. And those children will only hear the stories like we read in the Bible of the seven-year tribulation. Oh, Mom, I'm 16 now. Do I have to go to church? Have you heard it before? So many parents, they always come to me and say, well, they're 16 now. They should be able to make their own decisions. Since when? When hormones are raging in children, is 16 years old the ability for them to say, you can make your own decision. You know what my mother would say? You better get your hip out of bed. We going to church. And I'm very grateful that she did. Because it put a foundation in me that I may have strayed for a period of time, but I did come home. You see, we're going to experience this miraculous thing during the tribulation, but the children will only hear the stories. Zechariah 14, you can look it up later, tells us the Lord will punish them when they choose to rebel and say, we're not going to church. We're not going up to Jerusalem this year. That during the millennial kingdom, he will punish them by not allowing rain to fall on their land, and they'll be the only sick people. So everyone will know, <laughs> you got a cold? Well, <laughs> you better go to Jerusalem this year. So as soon as you sneeze, you know, <laughs> never mind, I was going to say something. I think we're, we're too close to COVID for me to joke about it way too soon. So the, the thing of, and I wasn't going to joke about COVID. That's not what I was going to do. Do you remember, okay, now I got it. Okay. So do you remember during COVID when you sneezed and it was like, everyone looked at you like you had the plague? Like all you would go, you'd go outside, choo, hoo, <laughs> You know, you were terrified. Like, you thought people were going to kill you when you sneezed, right? Just imagine sneezing in the millennial kingdom. Oh, got a sinner. <laughs> but we love you, okay? So just imagine this, okay? Now, with all of the wonders of the kingdom, with all of the glory of Jesus ruling and reigning, Satan is released and he still tempts them. And the Bible says he deceives them. In other words, he leads them astray. Why would, you, why would Satan want to lead them astray from going up to Jerusalem to worship? Because he wants to be worshipped still. Now, we don't know how long he's allowed to tempt. And we're not even given how, but we know his ways. We know he's a deceiver. We know he's a devourer. We know he's got three tricks in his, up his, in his little bag of tricks. He's got lust of the flesh. I want it my way. And I want it now. He's got lust of the eyes. I see it. I want it. And he's got the pride of life. I am a self-made man. Those are the only three tricks he's got. We know what he does. We know how he comes to us. So we know he's not changed. Prison for a thousand years. He doesn't come out rehabilitated. And look at what he's doing. The same character as to who he is because he's a liar. He's the father of lies. And we've got to be careful that we don't believe his lies. It grieves me. It grieves me when I meet with a 25-year-old young lady. She's this big. 
maybe 80 pounds. And some kid, when she was five years old, looked at her and said, you're ugly and you're fat. And the devil planted a lie in her. I'm ugly and no one wants to look at me. And so for her whole life, the enemy deceives her in that lie to where she becomes anorexic. That's what the devil does. He plants a lie, and we begin to believe that lie because of his deceitfulness. And the only way to be free of a lie is truth and the truth of the word of God. It's why our culture and society is so confused about their identity. Because they have forsaken the freedom that's found in truth. That is true. Now, I want us to note something here. He goes to the whole earth because the millennial kingdom is on the earth. And the people of earth, they've replenished Because death is not common any longer and people aren't dying. There's generations upon generations upon generations living on the earth. Go with me quickly to Isaiah 65. You'll see this. Isaiah chapter 65, we'll pick it up in verse 19. Isaiah chapter 65, we'll pick it up in verse 19. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people. The voice of weeping shall no longer be heard in her, nor the voice of crying, speaking of the millennial kingdom. Nor shall an infant from there live but a few days, nor an old man who has not fulfilled his days. For the child shall die 100 years old, but the sinner, being 100 years old, shall be accursed. Listen to the millennial kingdom. They're going to build houses, inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards, eat their fruit. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For as the days of the tree, so shall be the days of people. Look how long they're going to live. And my elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain nor bring forth children from trouble. No more pain in childbirth. Someone say hallelujah. Ladies, I thought you'd be a little more excited about that. <laughs> For they shall be the descendants. The, the, you know why the ladies didn't say hallelujah? I'm done having children. I, millennial kingdom or not, I'm not having any more kids. <laughs> and their offspring with them. What a wonderful place. What a normal place to be. So when you think millennial kingdom, think of yourself driving down your neighborhood street. It's just going to be normal with Jesus. That's powerful. And in this normal with Jesus, God is letting us know the answer to our question. I want the world to know as perfect as I've made it just like the Garden of Eden without Satan deceiving and tempting, your heart is desperately wicked apart from the grace of God. We all need Jesus. We all need Jesus. See, the saints, now go back with me to Revelation chapter 20. Satan deceives, and now all the saints, they gather in Jerusalem. They're aware of the attack. Most likely the Lord, the commander of the army of hosts, he's told them. Now, this is where God laughs, because what we're going to see is fire comes down from heaven. God lets Satan know, you're judged. You are judged, period. And John identifies Satan there in Revelation as the deceiver. And let me explain why. He has probably possessed some human being who is leading the rebellion, and John wants everyone to know it may look like this, but it really is the devil. I know some of the things that we listen to and watch sound really good, And make us laugh. It looks a certain way. But it's the devil. And we've got to be careful. Do you remember what our kids used to say? The music I listen to doesn't affect me. Then why are so many high school kids involved with premarital sex? If the music they listen to doesn't affect them. 
You see, he shows up as an angel of light. That's how he shows up. He's meant to deceive. And John wants us to know the deceiver is the devil. And he is thrown into the lake of fire. And can I tell you something about the lake of fire? It's real. It's real. It's a place of eternal suffering. It's there that we begin to see the importance of our theology. And here's where we close. Revelation chapter 20, verse 11. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heavens fled away. That's powerful. This throne is so great that heaven and earth run away, leaving no place for sinners to hide. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. Now we know that the work of God, according to John 6, is to believe. So the book declares they chose not to believe. Can you imagine hearing that? Do you remember when Sister Sally came over to your house and said, hey, I'd like to tell you about Jesus, and you looked at Sister Sally and said, I don't want Jesus. Imagine thinking about that for an eternity. Imagine that being a testimony where God points out the place that you said, I don't want God. One of the hardest funerals that I ever did the song that they played as they lowered the casket was, I did it my way. And I thought to myself, if you can hear where you're at right now, how this song must grieve you. You see, our theology begins to unfold here because the dead were judged according to their works. Verse 12, 13, the sea gave up the dead who were in it, Death and Hades delivered up the dead, so hell is only a holding ground for what they're going to. And they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Hell is real. Church, did you hear it? And before God will ensue the internal kingdom in Revelation 21, all sin must be eradicated. And that includes sinners. Calvary Chapel, South Bay. Zechariah is important. Because it's now with this theology that we understand the ramifications of unbelief eternal separation from God where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Revelation 20, torment. And God has sent his workers to announce that there's a great wedding feast. He's sending out the invitation. I just got one from a friend of mine. They're having a wedding. They sent me an invitation. I want to go because I want to eat the food. I'm excited about being with friends. I can't wait. Why wouldn't you want to go to a wedding unless you don't want to be part of the family? Well, I'm not going to that wedding. Church, our job, we are delivery people. We're postmen, post ladies, sending out the invitation to the wedding feast. Come one, come all. There's going to be a feast with God. And this feast will save you from hell. It's real. The application of our theology is to fulfill the great commission in our lives. At all costs. Let's pray. Father, we're so grateful for your word. Power. Grateful for those on a Sunday night, excuse me, a Thursday night, right before Christmas, would say, we want to know the word. And now with a 
deeper understanding of this theology, please do not let us just know something, but let us live something. And give us the power by your Holy Spirit with the knowledge that there is an eternal place separated from you where people will be tormented. And I believe with the thought of the moment where they rejected you. Fill us with your spirit. Like Acts chapter 4, give us more boldness that we might be a witness. Father, in these last days before Christmas, pour out your spirit on Calvary Chapel, South Bay. Give us the ability to minister your grace. In Jesus' name. There's a young lady she works at the Y in San Pedro I've been inviting her every day you're coming right you're coming right are you coming coming to Christmas Eve I'm not giving up because I know Life without Christ will lead to damnation. These aren't 21st century words, but they're true. And I need us to think about these names. They're eternities. And we're not studying Zechariah so that we can grow in Zechariah studying Zechariah so that we can proclaim truth to the world. Jesus Christ is coming again. You want to be ready. So church, as you now go out into your world with that name on your heart, Think more about their eternity than your fear. Would you stand with me? I love you guys. No, I really love you guys. Like, I'm not saying you don't love me, but like, I love being with you. I love all of you. I even love you people online. We love you. We wish you were here, but we do love you. You guys tell people online we love them because I'm hard on them a lot. We love you. <laughs> that was like Millennial Kingdom. Oh, you want to play with my cobra? <laughs> God bless you guys. Let's close in this song. I'll meet you out in the lobby. And uh, I can't wait to see you on Saturday. Please keep us in prayer. 6, 8, and 10. And then 1030 and 1230 on Christmas Day. And so keep us in prayer as we get ready for this great weekend to be together with the body of Christ. Amen. God bless you guys.